Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you to uh, the 30th anniversary of Midtown Community Court and to tonight's event, 30, day, 30 years of uh, justice in New York City, looking back and uh, looking beyond. Um, I'm John Wang. I am the presiding judge of Midtown Community Court. And I have uh, the great honor of introducing our first speaker tonight. That is the Chief Judge of the State of New York, the Honorable Rowan D. Wilson. I have to do the bio thing, unfortunately, uh, much to uh, Judge Wilson's chagrin because he's such a humble guy. I'm sorry, Chief, it just comes with the territory. Uh, Judge Wilson was born in uh, Pomona, California, he obtained his uh, BA from Harvard University and his law degree from Harvard Law School. Following graduation, he clerked uh, for the Honorable James Browning, uh, the chief judge of the US Circuit Court um, for the Ninth Circuit, uh, the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Um, following his clerkship, uh, he went on to join uh, the firm Cravath, Swain, and Moore. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're <laughs> small little shop right around the corner, uh, founded in about 1819. And for 30 years, uh, the chief judge was a, um, a general purpose litigator uh, at the firm. In the first of many firsts, Chief Judge Wilson became the first person of color and the youngest member at Cravath uh, to be elected partner. Um, and uh, in 2017, uh, he was appointed to the Court of Appeals as an associate judge. And in this April, he was nominated by Governor Kathy Hochul and confirmed by the New York State Senate to be the chief judge of the state of New York. So it is with uh, deep and sincere pleasure uh, that I get to introduce my chief, our chief, the chief judge of the state of New York, the Honorable Rowan D. Wilson. Um, thank you, Judge Wang. And I have to say, um, I, I've spoken at a lot of places over the last six months or seven months, and I think this is the place where I would say the people are the most like-minded to me. I also was told I have five minutes to speak, so I'm going to take, I'm going to take about ten. Um, I, I do want to thank the um, leaders of the Midtown Community Court and the Center for Justice Innovation, especially Courtney Bryan, and uh, Danielle Mendes for inviting me to say a few words here. And I, I also want to thank the chair of the Judiciary Committee, Senator Brad Hoylman Siegel, for his steadfast support of the Midtown Community Court. If you think he supports it as some sort of pork belly measure because it's within his own district, you couldn't be farther from the truth. I firmly believe that he and the legislature as a whole would like to support the expansion of the Midtown Community Court model throughout the state, and we're going to work towards that. This may be a little embarrassing, but this time of year, I rewatch my favorite classic holiday movies. Um, you know, uh, Christmas Carol, It's a Wonderful Life, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, uh, and Miracle on 34th Street. Uh, and those movies all have as their core a, a, fundamental, a couple of fundamental ideas. Elevation of the power of belief and recognition of humanity as inherently good and capable of redemption. But only one of those movies, Miracle on 34th Street, is a quintessential New York City story. In it, the Santa at Herald Square Macy's turns out to be the real Santa Claus, a revelation that changes and uplifts hearts and minds across the city. Sometimes, real life is just as uplifting as any holiday movie. Just four blocks north of where we are now is the miracle on 54th Street. It is another story imbued with the belief in the inherent goodness of people and the power of redemption and community. 
It began 30 years ago when, under the guidance of the Center for Justice Innovation, disparate groups, the judiciary, public defenders, the district attorney's office, social service providers and foundations and private businesses found common ground in their shared belief in the dignity and goodness of humanity and in the importance of empathy and came together to establish the institution we're here to celebrate tonight, the Midtown Community Court. Indeed, there are some other parallels between the miracles on 34th and 54th Street. Um, Santa was arrested for striking a man with an umbrella, <laughs> which I assume was a misdemeanor. Santa was sent to Bellevue and determined to be uh, delusional. Santa was ultimately cleared in a trial, in part through the testimony of the DA's young son, who firmly believed in Santa. And one of the adult protagonists got her Christmas wish of a home. Those issues, minor assaults, mental health issues, people need, in need of housing, are the bread and butter of the Midtown Community Court, which, like Santa's acquittal, could not have occurred without the active support of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. In that regard, I want to extend a special thanks to DA Bragg and his Deputy Chief of Public Safety, who I had the pleasure of meeting a couple of times, uh, Lauren Curatolo, who I know is here because I saw her, uh, both of whom believe in the Midtown Community Court even more than young children believe in Santa. The first court of its kind in the nation, the Midtown Community Court, was founded on a simple, powerful premise. A criminal case could be an opportunity to put people on the road to obtaining the support they desperately need instead of incarcerating them at great public expense and with poor outcomes for them and for the public at large. That idea may seem common sense now, but it was downright radical 30 years ago. As reported by the press at its opening, the court, which then was open only to those who pleaded guilty to certain low-level misdemeanors, ordered sentences that were not jail time but service in the community, where the charged uh, service were the, in the community where the charged uh, offense was committed, from sweeping streets to painting to folding clothes at the Salvation Army or working in soup kitchens. And for those defendants with drug or alcohol problems or other problems such as no housing, there was on-site and immediate professional counseling along with treatment referrals. Over the interve intervening decades, Midtown stayed true to its reimagining of judicial response to low-level offenses. But the breadth, depth, and reach of its work has grown far beyond the original model. Nowadays, guilty pleas are not required. The focus is on treatment and building support for persons in need. The court's efforts are individualized for each person and are restorative for both that person and the broader community. Midtown now serves some of our city's most vulnerable people, uh, outside the courtroom as well. For instance, through Project Reset, Midtown, Midtown offers pre-arraignment diversion opportunities for certain arrested individuals. Those who complete Project Reset may avoid standard case processing and criminal conviction. Another example is the Community First program launched in 2021 in partnership with uh, other local organizations. The Community First program sends community navigators into the community with socks, clothing, PPE, blankets, and food. The goal? building trusting relationships with people in and around Times Square to connect them with mental health services, help in housing, and medical treatment. Even beyond formal programming, the court maintains an open door policy for all former participants. And as the Midtown staff will tell you with great pride and, and well-deserved pride, many former participants do come back to continue with Midtown services even after their court case is closed and they have no threatened legal uh, actions pending. In Midtown, they found a support network in which they can participate. The theme that runs through every part of Midtown's story is that it has always put compassion for the people and community it serves at the forefront. Over the past couple of months, I've twice spent time seeing that compassion firsthand when I observed the Midtown Community Court at work. I watched as Judge Wang took painstaking care to welcome with a smile each person who appeared before him to pronounce each person's name correctly, and to ensure that each person understood how his case or her case was progressing. He also made it clear to each person that they were voluntarily there and could choose to go to the ordinary criminal court if they wanted. No one did. I watched Midtown social workers, including Jess Bennett, Mel Hodor, Melissa Roida, and Shiny Park, stand beside their clients and with great warmth update the court as to the hard work their clients had engaged in since their court date. Everything from completing the individualized assessments with Midtown 
to completing some or all of their required sessions to finding an apartment. I watched as Michael Baldwin of Legal Aid, who was the attorney for most of the people before the court the days that I was there, counseled his clients, advised the court of their status, and caringly explained when a client wasn't present. I watched as Assistant District Attorney Nicole Perry warmly responded to the progress and successes of each person before the court and genuinely smiled as she approved the dismissal of numerous cases in the furtherance of justice. I watched other staff, like Michonne Battle, circulate through the courtroom and ensure that those waiting for their appearances were comfortable and formed. She actually left our meeting upstairs early and said, I I've got a courtroom to run. <laughs> Several times over the course of the day, I watched the entire courtroom burst into applause, just like you did now, but much for a greater reason, when Judge Wang announced that a person had completed the prescribed program of care, he came down from the bench, shook that person's hand, and read aloud a personalized graduation certificate as the case was dismissed. And most importantly, I saw the faces and the reactions of the people who came before the court. There was no terror no anger, no animosity. Instead, the reactions ranged from incredulity to gratitude to joy, all mixed together sometimes, that the result of an arrest could be genuine care to understand and to help. One man who was fully engaged in the services provided for him had been arrested for criminal possession of a weapon because he displayed a kitchen knife at a group of officers saying, Please arrest me. I need help. As the officers approached him, he dropped the knife to the ground. Ask yourselves how his case would have been handled if the Midtown Community Court did not exist. The Midtown Community Court stands as a truly revolutionary model of justice, one that we can and should replicate elsewhere. Midtown demonstrates that when we select the right mix of matters for a specialty court, Everyone is better off. Defendants get the services they need, lead better lives, and are less likely to be involved in antisocial behaviors again. The community becomes safer, and community members have more faith in the court system. Cases in Midtown move with great rapidity. On average, cases end in 35 days. And the state spends fewer resources incarcerating those who should be, not be locked up in the first place. To put it briefly, Midtown makes our justice system stronger, faster, and more effective. Midtown is living proof that when we put people at the center of our work, the results that follow are, in a word, in a holiday word, miraculous. And unlike those holiday movies, Midtown Community Court is here to uplift all of us all year round. Thank you all very much. getting a little emotional, I have to say, in the back, listening to you, Judge Wilson. And um, it, it, before I share my remarks, which now, frankly, uh, <laughs> I, I might need to do some improvising, um, I want to say what an extraordinary uh, person Judge Wilson is in just the few times that I have met with him because he has met with us and he has come and sat at the Midtown Community Court, not as just a drive-by, but literally last Friday sat and all these stories are from his observation because he was there witnessing what was happening at Midtown and seeing that this is not just something that should exist at Midtown, but that this is what should be happening in our entire criminal justice system. And so thank you, Judge Wilson. Um, so, I am Courtney Bryan, and I'm the executive director here. <laughs> Thank you. It's so nice to see so many, um, so many friends and, and colleagues, and also a lot of new faces, too, um, uh, joining us here today to celebrate 30 years of the Midtown Community Court, 30 years of justice. 
if you don't have a tween uh, or a teenage daughter <clears throat> like I do who follows fashion, um, you may not know the 90s are back <clears throat> and better than ever. Doc Martens, high-waisted jeans, flannel shirts, and even fanny packs. And that's the theme for tonight's conversation. <clears throat> um, okay, not 90s fashion, of course. Um, but really, what was the conversation and what were the innovations around safety and justice in the 90s? Those that bred projects like the Midtown Community Court. What was good? What should we bring back, double down on, and where should we go in the future? So it's my job to illustrate, uh, to introduce, I'm sorry, and moderate our illustrious panel. Um, but I do think that a, a few moments of um, further reflection on Midtown, although like I said, it's really tough to follow the act uh, that just Judge Wilson just um, gave us in terms of really understanding and communicating the ethos of this approach and this court. Um, as, as uh, Judge Wilson alluded, the court really has served as both a catalyst for and a mirror of the changes that we've seen in our justice system over the last 30 years. It's a place that's near and dear to my heart for a number of reasons. First, it was the Center for Justice Innovation, which uh, we were the Center for Court Innovation. It was our first project, our first operating program, first kind of proof of concept, it turns out. Um, and that's very special. I also served as a director of the Midtown Community Court and I see so many of my predecessors and successors who are here who served in that capacity, I think for all of us, a life-changing uh, professional opportunity. And I was there when we celebrated our 20th anniversary. But, but really my feelings aside, the court is still around, uh, the fact that the court is still around really says something, that this court continues to play an important role in making justice fair, making it effective, making it humane. It remains an ongoing engine of reform. And thanks to the thoughtfulness and commitment of the New York State court system in particular for that, for everyone who has worked in the court, the amazing people inside and outside of government who have partnered with the court and the many funders, researchers, community members, businesses, um, other nonprofits who've contributed their ideas and their resources to help the court stay on the cutting edge. As Judge Wilson noted, when the court opened in October of 1993, let's take a moment and think back. What were we wearing uh, that time? <laughs> What were we doing in October of 1993? The idea that a court could, um, the idea that a court should try to solve the problems of people charged with crimes or the communities they impacted was absolutely, a, a, a novelty was revolutionary. And quite a few resisted that idea. And, in, in, uh, and I won't name names, but we know a few of the offices <coughs> who, who were very publicly um, uh, opposed to the Midtown Community Court, and I'm pleased that they've come around. Um, the question that they were asking is, isn't it the business of the courts to simply, you know, process cases, determine culpability, and issue sentences from a bench on high? But the people who launched this court, many of whom are here in this room today, <clears throat> and don't worry, you will have to be acknowledged later. Um, imagine something new, something bold. They asked, why can't courts do all of that, yes, and care about improving the community and the lives of everyone who passes through those courthouse doors? As Judge Wilson said, this is a people-first approach. We didn't have that language in 1993, but that's what it was and what it continues to be, recognizing that there are far more productive, less harmful ways to hold people accountable or to address crime. The court's planners rethought everything, including the courthouse design. And I was so pleased to meet a few of, uh, of a few architects in the room, including the original, the, archi the original, the OG architect of, of the Midtown Community Court, Alta Indebun, who is here. Um, thank you, Alta. Uh, but those original planners, uh, including uh, John Feinblatt, most especially, who was the founding director of the Midtown Community Court and then the Center for Court Innovation, 
even looked at the design of the courthouse. They built a courthouse, a courtroom that was bright and well lit with a video monitor um, showing the day's calendar and an audio system to help people understand and hear what was happening in the courtroom. And they were really the first to integrate technology uh, to help judges make better and swifter decisions. And I just, let's think back what that technology looked like. Greg Steinberg, I'm looking at you right now. I mean, the computer was like this, I think the depth of the computer and what the, you know, I can see it now, the dot matrix printing and, um, but it was cutting edge at the time. Um, in the police holding cells, the planners has removed the bars and placed um, glass instead, finding the bars stigmatizing. They also made sure at the court to, make, to move things quickly. Um, no more waiting for months to have cases finished. With services right there on site, people could fulfill their requirements that very day, their first appearance before the court, and get on with their lives, or they could get that first connection to the help that they needed within minutes of seeing the judge or entering the courthouse. Thanks in large part to the court's example, New York City has scaled the integration of social services in the criminal court system and absolutely set an example for the nation. Police, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and judges, and everyone involved in the system now have a whole array of, of approaches, alternatives to incarceration that I hope are increasingly becoming the default as opposed to an alternative. And almost every year, new reforms emerge, ones that expand eligibility, that look to new types of cases, new types of populations, and try to divert more and more people as early as possible in the justice process. We absolutely still have a ways to go, the stain of Rikers Island being the most urgent example, but we as a city have shown that you can reduce both crime and incarceration. It is not either or. The Midtown Community Court helped expand our idea of what justice means and continues to keep doing that today. In the coming months, we're aiming to renew our commitment to human-centered design in the courtroom again, looking to lower the bench so that the judge can be eye to eye with the participants and the parties, and adding a round table to allow everyone to confer in an environment that fosters participation and understanding of the legal process. And most excitingly, we're looking to transform those holding cells into a healing space, creating a restorative space for programming, for counseling, for communities to use. And there's an exciting uh, other change, another change coming from Midtown, but we're gonna save that announcement for later at the end of the evening. So now that we've talked about Midtown, uh, the Midtown Community Court and its legacy, I'd like to broaden the discussion to talk about justice in New York City more generally, past, present, and future. How do we realize a justice system that is truly equitable, that centers people's humanity, that reduces unnecessary incarceration, and promotes healing and supports safe, healthy communities? We have a wonderful panel here today who's going to help us answer those questions, and I'd like to invite them to the stage. Welcome. So um, I quickly want to introduce everybody. Some people need no introduction, um, I think. But uh, starting at the end, Marlon Peterson, <laughs> who is the executive director of College and Community Fellowship. He's also an author. Um, an amazing human being who serves on our board and um, started his connection to the center. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to leave that. Uh, you'll, you'll hear that in a second. Um, next to him is Rasmani, <laughs> Rasmia Kermani, Raz, who is also uh, our board chair. Raz does so many things. It's really hard to, uh, to put in one sentence, but you, a senior fellow at Hester Street. She um, is also on the city's planning, a member of the city's planning uh, commission, and she is our board chair. Next, I'd so this is the delight of the evening, is to have Errol Lewis not sitting in this chair, <laughs> sitting in that chair. Errol, again, I think one of us, uh, we all know and love him, um, as a, an anchor at New York One and inside City Hall, but also just being 
an absolute mensch when it comes to supporting justice and social issues um, and, and the center most specifically, but, but more broadly. Um, so thank you, Errol. Mindy Tarlow, <clears throat> again, a person who's had so many, um, so many lives in, in civic life and in public service, both in government, um, running, uh, creating the Center for Employment Opportunities, and now um, at Blue Meridian Partners in Philanthropy. And then finally, um, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. And there are a few things to say about you, but we'll, we'll get to that. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to start and end this panel with a lightning round. The lightning round to start with is you each have a connection to the Midtown Community Court first. So we're going to start with Midtown and then we're going to move more broadly. Um, what is that first or formative connection that you have to the Midtown Community Court? So I'm going to actually start with you, Marlon, if that's okay. Um, first of all, happy birthday. 30 years. Um, I love I, being 30. <laughs> um, and good evening to everyone. Um, thanks for coming out here this evening. So my first thought of uh, interaction with Midtown Community uh, Court is interesting. So I worked for the center um, in, in Crown Heights back uh, at NIA, what it was formerly called uh, Crown Heights Community Mediation Center. I see the crew from the crew over there, over here, all the folks. Um, and so I have a, we have, you know, CCI, C, at the time CCI, we have meetings at, you know, different courts, you get to meet with different uh, projects. And I had a meeting at Midtown Community Court. So as I'm walking to the building, I'm from Brooklyn, I've been in New York, you know, I'm, I've traversed all these streets, but not for this particular purpose. As I'm walking up to the building, I was like, this place looks familiar. Cause it's my first time going there in that capacity. So as I'm in, I'm walking through the whole, you know, I'm going through it. I said, oh, wait, I have been here before. So way back when in 1998, I was arrested for a uh, fair evasion, jumping a turnstile, and uh, end up going through Midtown. I didn't know what it was at that time. I was, what, 18 at the time, so I had no idea what I was going through. Um, but I ended up realizing that's what it was. I ended up having to do community service for it. Um, but that is my first interaction uh, with Midtown Community Court as a participant and not on the board of the organization. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Thank you. Raz? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so in 1995, I was 22. Um, I'm also 30 now. It's amazing. <laughs> um, but in 1995, I was 22 and I was the receptionist at the then relatively new Times Square Business Improvement District. Um, and I see Tim Tompkins in the audience. Um, under the incredible leadership of Gretchen Dykstra. And there are many profound things that I could say, but this is not one of those times. Um, but the first, my, really the first connection to Midtown Community Court um, I have is that Gretchen would often yell to me lovingly, 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 um, interrupt me if any of the Jonathans call. <laughs> and that was John Feinblatt, <laughs> Chief Judge Jonathan Lipman, and I found out very soon um, who she was talking about and why. Um, I will say in the 28 years since then, every single job I've had in New York City has had a connection to the Center for Justice Innovation, every single one. And so there is a, a through line there. And like Marlon, for me, from 22 receptionist to not 22, um, <laughs> proud 50-year-old um, <clears throat> board chair, it's, it's an incredible um, kind of evolution. Thanks. I live in Brooklyn and uh, have mostly first connected with the organization through some of the work in Brooklyn in Crown Heights and, and so forth. But when asked to have an answer to this, I said, actually, I was involved in a case here uh, in the late 90s. It was a small claims uh, case. Um, I regret to tell you, Judge Wang, that the, the judge in that case um, erred. Uh, <laughs> 
but I felt heard. I felt heard, and I felt respected. Um, and that's, that's what really matters. But I, I, I associate the, the, the dawn and the emergence of this, of this organization and this court with uh, a, a ferment that was going on at the time uh, with alternatives to incarceration, with uh, the emergence of what later came to be called the reentry movement. There was a lot of discussion. There were people like Mindy Tarlow that everybody was talking about. There were organizations that were uh, e experimenting in some really interesting ways. And in hindsight, and it is nice to be 30. I like it so much I did it twice. Um, uh, it, 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 in hindsight, it really is remarkable that w given the problems that the city was facing at the time, uh, people took the time, uh, you know, and so we often hear now that, oh, we can't get to this. Uh, people are frightened, people are scared, the politics aren't right and so forth. The politics couldn't have been more wrong at the time. <laughs> And we still got it done. And, and it's really a tribute to this organization. Thank you. Mindy, tell your origin story. So, hi everybody. Um, my origin story goes back a little further um, because I was at OMB, New York City Office of Management and Budget at the time. Um, and I worked for Mike Jacobson. It's fun to invoke all of these names. I worked for the great Mike Jacobson at the time. And he and I, convinced the budget director to actually fund the Midtown Community Court. And I, 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 my memory is that it was $1.1 million was what we put in. And we just said it's because it's the right thing to do. We weren't going to make some big fiscal argument. It was just something that was important and we should do it. What we forgot to do was tell the deputy mayor. <laughs> so the deputy mayor actually ended up hearing about it, unfortunately, from the Manhattan District Attorney, Robert Morgenthau at the time. And um, Mike and I got called to the deputy mayor's office and got yelled at, and it was very scary. <laughs> but it was worth it. So that's my first memory. So I'm, 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 I'm later to the party. I don't have a 1990s memory, um, maybe because I'm you know, not quite 30 yet. Um, but, but I have a very consequential uh, memory. Uh, during uh, the height of COVID, I took a Zoom tour of uh, Midtown, uh, immediately fell in, in love with Midtown and all of the services to be offered. And then very, very shortly after uh, taking office, and Courtney still talks to me, uh, recruited the person who helped organize that tour, Lauren. Thank you. Um, yes, I still talk to you. <laughs> so you have the next question, um, which is that you grew up in, so while you may not have early um, connection to the court, you grew up in Manhattan, you grew up in Harlem in the 80s and 90s. And when you think back to 1993, um, what, do you, what do you recall the city being like? I think Errol and I are gonna battle Brooklyn and Harlem stories. Um, <laughs> uh, look, I mean, you know, everyone, uh, well, maybe not everyone, but mo most of the folks who I've talked with tonight were here then, so this is not, this is not breaking news, but for me, but in 93, I was uh, midway through, through college, and you know, they gave us the, the questions before, so I had a chance to think about this. And, and in 93, um, and I've spoken publicly about, about sort of the juxtaposition of, of growing up in Harlem and having you know, traditional public safety challenges, uh, and then also having police accountability challenges. And I think it was 93 or perhaps 94 when sort of one of the most horrific to me, which sort of defines that time, which was uh, a, a stop uh, on about 133rd and 8th Avenue by no less than 50 police officers, uh, including the SWAT team, uh, invoking uh, the sort of Central Park Five prosecution, claiming that my friends and I uh, had stabbed someone in Central Park. Uh, so noteworthy for the first half of that, which was that was obviously horrific, and defined you know, part of my, my, my time growing up. But equally as noteworthy, um, and this was a hot summer day, lots of people came out, um, is that the walk from their home, because when 75 police officers stop you, the, the block takes notice and think, well, you must be really hard, was my like safest walk home ever. 
Um, and so, you know, funny but horrific. When that, that to me, obviously, a lot of great things happened in the 90s. The birth of, birth of the Harlem segment of hip hop, I would say, uh, the re renaissance of it. But, but, but for this conversation, that, that, you know, and obviously some of those issues persist, but, but thankfully we're, we, we, we've made some progress. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Errol, you, while you claim Brooklyn, I will have to share that you were raised in New Rochelle. Very true, very true. <laughs> New Rock, very true. I did some in investigative reporting yes. here. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Brooklyn call. Um, uh, and, and your mom and dad, uh, by your mom and dad, and I guess your dad was in the NYPD. Um, uh, in 1993, you started the Central Brooklyn Credit Union. Um, and tell, you know, similar war story, what kind of back and forth, what, what, what were you seeing in, well, at mean, that look, time in 93? The, the city was, there are some younger people who don't, who weren't there at the time, and it was an incredibly dangerous place. Uh, it, was, it was shockingly dangerous. And I live, lived and live in the 77th precinct in Northern Crown Heights, which for those who remember was uh, the, the scene and the precinct where a very notorious corruption scandal within the police department took place called the Buddy Boys, where the cops in the precinct were selling drugs. Um, there was no protection and it was, it was how it felt. We were over-policed and under-protected at the same time and, and it was just shocking. I mean, I. I did see dead bodies in the street. I did see people get mugged in the street. It was, it was horrible. Um, now, in the middle of all of this, we decided to start a multi-million dollar financial institution. Uh, and among other things, there were real questions about how we would keep ourselves safe, how we would handle cash. Um, my father, as you mentioned, um, when he retired, he was an inspector. My sister was a detective, uncles, cousins, the whole thing. Um, so I knew enough people that I could get a carry permit. And it was, a, it was a real interesting and important question, and it was ultimately a faith and somewhat religious question. It's like, do I really want to walk around here with one more weapon uh, in, in a scenario where, as my father explained to me, uh, the way he put it to me was, your problem is you would stop walking away from things you need to walk away from. Um, and as usual, he was right. And I made one visit to the pistol unit and they said, sure, we'll take care of the paperwork and stuff. And I thought about it, I was like, you know what, never mind. Um, but those were the kind of really hard choices that a lot of people had to make, not just merchants or people trying to run an organization that had a lot of currency around, but just walking through the streets, just, just trying to sort of make it, make it all work. Um, and again, police, rela police community relations were at what had to be an all time low at that point. I mean, what these guys were doing and you know, they all were held accountable. A lot of people went to prison, uh, the cops. Um, but it was, it was a really, really tough time. Um, and again, just as it was a tough time budgetarily, it was a tough time, you know, sort of programmatically and from a policy standpoint to start talking about uh, a different way of doing things. But, you know, on, on one level, as I, as I talk about it out loud, we almost had no choice because what we had in place wasn't working. So it was definitely time for something new. Thanks. Um, so Mindy, I wanna turn to you. Um, as I, sh and some people know, worked in government, you shared OMB, you've been in a number of different roles in government um, and, and know how the sausage is made. Um, tell us about that climate. Uh, as, as Errol said, maybe we had no choice and maybe that's kind of what the feeling was, but when you were at OMB um, in those early days, um, tell us about um, the political climate and then you know, what was happening in the 90s that sort of set the city in motion for the kinds of reforms that we see. Yeah, and I would pick up right where you left off, which is for me, the time is the summer of 1990 where everything that you're hearing was coming to a boiling point. Um, and those of you who are students of the New York Post and were alive at that time might remember that it spilled over into a screaming headline of Do Something Dave. This was when David Dinkins was mayor, first black mayor in New York, and all of this was going on on his watch. Um, and I was at OMB, and the response, I think the thing I wanna share, which I actually, it was in some ways really fun to look back on all of this, you know, in preparation for this, um, is, is it really was a time where we had to do something else. 
Um, and the mayor, to his credit, could easily have just said, let's hire 5,000 cops and keep walking, um, but he didn't. He did two things um, that I got to the privilege of working on and seeing up close. One was saying, we're not gonna just hire police officers. We're gonna more comprehensively look at the criminal justice system as a whole. Because at that time, it wasn't just about crime rising and all of that. It was also about tremendous jail overcrowding. Um, it wasn't even just Rikers. There were floating facilities and like barges and ferries and you know tents and things like that. It was insane. Um, and that's what was going on. Um, so how do you fund a system System more comprehensively and how do you make more sense of it and how do you balance that with preventive services and services for youth and kids and education and after school so um, that was what we were asked to do and everybody played their part you know the police department scoured you know every position and what could go you know more um, out onto the streets our job at OMB was to create a model, um, and remember it was 1990, so model really meant like Lotus one, two, three, you know, spreadsheet, you know, me in a room all night long um, to figure out what kind of, it's true, um, what kind of arrests would actually happen and how would those arrests get addressed by the district attorneys, by legal aid, and importantly and pivotally, alternatives to incarceration. Um, and that was a really important part of the plan, which looking back, I feel incredibly proud of having been able to be part of that. So ultimately, this initiative became Safe Streets, Safe City, an omnibus criminal justice plan for New York City, subtitle Cops and Kids. Um, and we were able to, yeah, it was kind of great. And we were able to then, you know, go to the city council. This is the sausage, more sausage being made. Go to the city council, um, you know, come to terms with them. Um, then we aligned, went to Albany um, to get some of the tax revenue. And you might remember there was a, a ill-fated Safe Street, Safe City lottery. Um, and that's how all of that stuff got funded. And for me, I mean, I was uh, not 30, but close. I was probably like 28 or 29. Um, to be able to witness the ability to convince an administration to fund alternatives and not buy another prison barge, you know, and fund um, youth services and education instead was pretty great and I carry it with me to this day. Um, and it was really sort of a profound moment. Thank you. Marlon, you wrote a book. Uh, you're welcome to plug it here now. Um, <laughs> wrote a book about going to prison as a teenager um, for a crime committed in the late 90s. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you think the system would treat you differently today um, than it did then? And do you, do you see signs of progress um, based on that? Yeah, I'm happy we got these questions in advance. Um, <laughs> the crime, I, I, was, I was arrested for, and I was initially arrested for felony murder. I don't think that the system would treat anybody with felony murder differently now, right? That's still on the books. So I just want to be clear about that part. Um, I think that um, we start the conversation around the system of when I was in, in, incarcerated. I think in the opening remarks from Judge Wang, even your opening comments, we spoke about all the other things that are addressed outside of the, in, the carceral experience. So I kind of want to flip the question a little bit in terms of what, how the system, I think there are different systems that we have to talk about before we speak about the feeder of the criminal justice system. The first thing is that I think about 1993, and I was a teenage, uh, 13, 14 around that time, now eighth grade going into high school. Um, and I remember I was jumped and robbed uh, as a freshman in high school, and the police came to the school and did all the things. And all they did was put me in front of the people who, who snuck into the school, uh, these people snuck into the school with the older kids. They only just put me in front of them and said, point them out. Now, nothing happened to me after that, thankfully. But you just sort of think about, I'm thinking about systems, right? Right there, I realized that this system put me in danger when I was already hurt. That's the first thing I want to say. Um, I think about going forward, I mentioned a joke about the, um, 
uh, being arrested for uh, fear evasion. I don't think people should be arrested for that, right? But this is the thing I want to say around that, though. This is the thing I want to say around that, is that that experience exposed me to the system in a way which made me less traumatized me to the place where it made it easy for me to make a decision a year later, which landed me in prison for a decade. So the question about do I think the system would have treated me differently? Let me, let me say that the question about what system are we talking about? Right? There are many other systems that we come before this one, right? And I think that when we think about the criminal legal space, we only think about, you know, uh, as we should, about decarceration ways. We can think about ATI alternative incarcerations. We should be thinking about those things without question. But I think we lose a p big part of it when we think about all the other things that are happening in these communities before somebody goes there. So when I think about the system, I have to think about these other things that's happening in the system. I think about just so think about the school system, an example. I think that I'm happy. I mean, we're not 100%, but I think, you know, I remember when kids who had learning disabilities, they were just put in a class. And a lot of these, and, and we made fun of these kids because they, sing, they stood out in a certain way. These kids ended up being a lot of kids that harmed other people in our own neighborhoods. So I think about the school system also, how the school system would have treated us differently. Because me as a singular person is my experience, but I'm also, I was one of many black boys, and, uh, many black young people in Brooklyn in the 90s who were experiencing all these other systems that made us less likely to trust the criminal justice system in the first place. We already knew that these systems wasn't working for us. So, um, so to think about my personal experience, and I wrote, you know, I wrote a book that detailing my experiences before my, my, my incarceration. I spent a great deal of time in that book, uh, Bird on Cage and Abolitionist Freedom Song. I suggest you, know, you check it out. But like, I spent a great deal of that time speaking about all the things that were happening before I got arrested at 19. Right? Because all those things, all those systems I interacted with as a young person did not support me. Right? So by the time I got to this system, I already didn't expect any support from this system. I already, this is sort of like what I understood. And to be clear, I didn't come up, I didn't grow up in a, in a terrible home environment. Right? My home environment was, you know, normal in a sense, right? Two parents, father worked, mother worked, older siblings. I was a Jehovah's Witness. I was knocking on doors in the Crown Heights. You might have seen me one day knocking on your door, Arrow. <laughs> St. Mark's Ave, I know, I know. Um, <laughs> um, you might have seen, so, but, um, so a person with these, ex my, my trajectory was not to lead to incarceration. That's the point I'm trying to say to you. But it didn't matter that what my trajectory was, my personal home experience, I had to think about the experience of the community, the environment that we're working with the people in our systems. These conversations were seen as, for somebody to think about asking a formerly incarcerated person how the system worked for you back then was absurd, mm -hmm. right? Just think about that. They were absurd. So when you when you mute people, they yell, or they try to they try to punch out. And I think a lot of that was happening to folks then. I think now you know about thirty years later. Um, I'm happy that one, we have a room where people, as Judge Wang had opened, uh, not Judge Wang, uh, Judge uh, um, Wilson opened up about like-minded folks, right? He opened up in his comments about that. I think that is, and I'm assuming in terms of this progressive way of looking at how we work with people, he spoke about people, putting people first. I always have a sort of personal manager of, per people, of people work. I think starting with that sort of language, sort of thing about how people would treat people differently now, I think the way we humanize folks now in the space, right? And not only the way we humanize them, the way folks are allowed to take charge of their own agency in these spaces, um, I think is, is one of the things that I'm happy for as we are 30, 30 years later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Rasmia, <clears throat> I have heard yes. you speak a few times about um, not just focusing when we have these kinds of conversations, not just focusing on the where there's a lack, uh, you know, where justice is lacking, where you have a, a absence of justice, but also lifting up where we see the presence of justice. And and <clears throat> we've we've heard a little bit about that today. Where do you where do you see the presence of justice? So yeah, I think um, I was also happy to have this question ahead of time too. Um, I do keep lists of lots of things. I mean, I'm a big nerd like that, so I keep lists of <laughs> things I love, my top 10 favorite hotel bars in New York City, if anybody wants that <laughs> list. Um, but I do keep a list of where I see the presence of justice. I don't think I would have called it that when um, I would have called it something different when I worked in Brownsville for a decade, but 
I wrote, I picked the ones that were relevant to CJI. Um, so I think so often as social justice kind of movement builders and organizers, we are oriented towards identifying and calling out the absence of justice. And I think that that's an incredibly important thing to do in the fight for justice, but I would argue that it's equally important to recognize and call out the presence of justice when justice exists where it perhaps did not before. So um, I think because of CJI, I really did write them out, um, and things that I've seen at CCI, now CJI, is that justice is, for those of you in here that know, um, beyond Belmont the community-led revitalization of Brownsville's hi historic corridor, right? Justice is how the Red Hook Community Justice Center worked to transform how courts and judges work with people entering the justice system with dignity in design and humanity. Justice is the power of anti-violence work in communities that is saving lives and supporting people's future, led by the people from those communities. <laughs> Justice is neighborhood stat, where NYCHA residents have the power to create their own solutions, which they knew anyway. <laughs> Just saying. Um, Justice is bail reform, decarceration, and closing Rikers. <clears throat> Justice is, and I know Julian likes this one, um, and I really mean it, this is the nerd out one. Justice is data and research that demand the broader system be held accountable, not just in policy reform, but what comes after that? The very sexy implementation. <clears throat> Justice is launching the New York City Housing Justice Corps to prevent evictions. <clears throat> and justice is honestly centering racial justice in everything everyone should do. So we know, we know, we know, we know that systems are broken, but we also know where those solutions are and they're in communities making the community and people an equal partner in creating justice. And I think this sounds hokey and Pollyannish, but I really don't mean it to. And I think those who know me really know that, you know, when we do this and when you see the presence of justice in moments, over years, over days, in a meeting, in a hug, that honestly joy is possible that joy is present and that is justice. What love looks like is justice. There is love in this work. And you know, to kind of quote Cornel West, as he reminds us, you know, justice is what love looks in public. And so when you see it, you know it. And, and I really don't mean to be hokey about it at all, but love is there. And it has to be there. Love and joy and celebration have to be there for justice to exist. Thank you. <clears throat> um, man, it's hard to ask this next question after that because it's about the polls, Alvin. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> but the real concern that people have in New York and you know, real and perceived, um, about crime, that there's polling that people are more concerned about crime now than they have been in the last 30 years since you know the times Mindy was describing. Um, so you know how do you how have you responded? How do you respond to that both legitimate concern but also not backslide into some regressive policy? And where do you think you know a place like Midtown and those kinds of uh, programs uh, and responses can play a role? So, and this is in some ways for me is the million dollar question, uh, particularly coming off the last 18 months. I think it's a really important one. And I've you know, been in a lot of different rooms where there's sort of a palpable sense of, of safety that doesn't match with some of the experiences we talked about 
the, the 90s. I mean, certainly we know the, the data and a lot of this from those the data, but the, the, the sense is real and I think we have to, to meet that. I mean, I'll just can talk about how I've processed it and sort of how I am trying to sort of adapt the way I talk. Some of it learned from people in this room. Uh, so when we talk about this work, and I love how you talked about it, which is great, um, you know, it is love. Uh, and I know I approach the work of, you know, so, you know, for example, in our office, our, you know, drug court diversion is up 200%, our felony ATI is up 140%, and I, my first way of thinking about that uh, is about those people's lives. And I think that's important, I think it's important to center. But for the public conversation, I think particularly for me in my role, but I would say even more broadly, is the importance to sort of bridge that and talk about that as public safety work. Um, you know, this is public safety work. This is making us safer and sort of certainly can start with the human uh, but really, particularly for folks who are feeling like, why are you doing that? You should see some more people to jail. You know, we have the data, we have the personal narratives, and you know, particularly when we think about you know, uh, you know, this 30th anniversary, um, you know, we lived through it. We, we, I lived through seeing relatives and friends cycling in and out of Rikers, um, you know, for various things and not being safer. And we have the data to back that up. But I think, and and really, I sort of talked to myself in terms of trying to. Kind of what the message is for, you know, you asked about polls, specifically for the next two years, for me, if, if, as opposed to how I talked about the last two years, is being very, very intentional uh, of saying, you know, Lauren's work, to be very specific, that's public safety work. Obviously, we have people who are doing homicide prosecution, we have folks who are doing, you know, very, very kind of traditional public safety work. But to talk about this work is work that is making us safer. Um, and then I love the point about data. We, you know, we are studying what we're doing so that we can you know, talk about it and sort of have the receipts. Um, but I think being very, very intentional about it. And like I said, I've learned that from a lot of people in this room. But um, I know for me, particularly when you sort of, in a room like this, feel the love, feel the emotion, and feel the joy, you see, you know, I too have visited Midtown Community Court. You sit there and you just you think about the lives affected, because that's human. Uh, but to then go the next sentence, particularly for people who are doubting the work or doubting the focus, and say, this, this is going to make you safer. Um, I think that's, that's where we win this battle. Okay, last question, lightning round. Um, if you could have everyone in this room, and this room, just so you know, all of you know, you're in the company of like an incredibly diverse set of, of New Yorkers, mostly New Yorkers, um, advocates and uh, funders and community leaders, business people, um, you know, just a, a, a great room. Um, so if you can think about what, what would you want everyone in this room um, to leave in terms of a sort of justice issue that this city will face in the next decade? Kind of, so we've talked a little bit about the present, what we can learn from the present, uh, from the past to present, but what what is on the horizon um, in the next 10 years? And you know whether it's something that we're gonna look back on and say, man, I can't believe we were doing that in 2023. Um, and, or, what, you know, what are you imagining um, in five, 10 years from now that um, you want us to be kind of thinking, can we get to that place? So um, who wants to start? <laughs> I'm gonna put you, Errol, on the, on the spot. So now you know what it sure. feels like. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, look, uh, 20, 30 years ago, it, people would have looked at you like you were talking crazy if you were talking about closing prisons and you were talking about um, decarcerating in a big and meaningful way. Or even if you were talking about raising the age of criminal responsibility or uh, making it so that people would not have their collateral consequences follow them forever in the form of something like clean slate. We got all of those things done. I project out, and I, I think back, though, to some unfinished business that I hope we'll all get to. I saw Judge Matthew Demick here a little bit earlier. I don't know if he's still here, but the, I, I, I visited his court, it must have been 2004, 2005. It was a long time ago. Uh, and it was, it was singular, and it was unique, and it was experimental. And now we fast forward, and it's still kind of singular and unique and experimental. So I would hope that when we all convene 25 or 30 years from now, we say, 
Can you believe that we took that long to get off the ground? I think uh, dealing better with what is now called mental health court or, or different kinds of ways of dealing with people who have a certain kind of uh, medical issues will in hindsight be seen as something we should have done all along, that we should have gotten to it sooner uh, and it will take its place alongside re-entry and raise the age and clean slate and community courts as a, a different way of, of achieving justice. And I'm actually confident that that's gonna happen. I mean, the, when we see all of the different headlines, and I know my organization contributes to those headlines, uh, ab about uh, the, the people acting out or tragedies happening, and there's a mental health edge to it. Um, this horrible case, these multiple murders that were just reported out of Queens. Um, that tells me it's, it's time. And it makes me feel like I felt in the 90s, where it's like, this is intolerable. We're going to have to do something entirely different. The good news is I think we know what to do. And, um, and I think we'll be celebrating that in the future. Yep. Thank you. Cindy. So I'm going to say two related things. Um, one, picking up on Clean Slate. I actually believe that in the next 10 years or so, Clean Slate could actually exist for everybody. That you would not leave prison with a conviction hanging over your head forever and the 44,000 collateral consequences that go along with it. Um, that it would, you would have a clean slate. And I honestly believe that that's possible. I'm approaching senior citizenship and I believe that in my lifetime, that that will happen. But that's really a beginning, not an end in, in some ways, because what I really want to see is fair chance hiring um, really take hold all across the nation. You know, you mentioned I ran the Center for Employment Opportunities, which gets jobs for people coming home from prison. I see Chris Watler is here carrying the flag. Um, but, and, and, and it started a long time ago. I think I saw Paul Samuels here, and we, um, they created the National Hire Network all the way back in 2001, which was the first time anybody really started focusing on helping folks get jobs who were coming out of prison. And I actually think that going forward, it should just be, it should just be a foregone conclusion that your criminal past does not affect your pathway to employment and that there is a legitimate fair chance, not just for that first job or that bottom rung of the ladder, but for a genuine career pathway. That's my hope. T.A. Bragg. Errol took my answer, um, but, but, but I, I'm gonna, I was sitting and thinking, do I do another one? But I think it's so, I, I just wanna double down. And to me, I mean, and, and the answer I talk about is, is, the, is the mental health. I mean, you know, if you go to a criminal court, certainly in Manhattan, I think it's citywide, you just see the brokenness of our, of our healthcare system uh, and it's heartbreaking. And so the fact that we just need to harden our resources. And, and I, I just, when I heard you talking, Errol, I was thinking, if it's 30 years, we have a deep problem because this is like a now issue. Um, I think I think that um, you know when we are looking at the resources and we had to, you know, I was talking about our, our, our felony ATI diversion, you know, the funding, you know, and you know we know this. We had this conversation. Well, like the 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 system is not. We have you know hit the ceiling in terms of what the system can accommodate financially in Manhattan. Um, and we're nowhere near where we need to be. Uh, and so if we are, if this is out 30 years, public safety is gonna be really harmed in the 30 years to get there. So I just, I'll, I'll echo what Errol says, but really just really trying to put an urgency from literally this is an everyday issue in the Manhattan DA's office. Thank you. Russ Mia. Um, I want, everyone to leave um, thinking about the connection between the justice system and NYCHA and public housing and public housing residents. I want you to think about housing as a justice related issue in every way. From narrative and the false narratives and the dominant narratives and assumptions that those narratives make about public housing and public housing residents that we and as a society, as a city, often 
do not value public housing as essential infrastructure and do not value public housing residents as New Yorkers. And we do not value deeply affordable housing. I mean, it's NYCHA, it's deeply affordable, it's housing. And these are issues of economic justice, racial justice, housing justice, and they are directly tied to the criminal justice system. And the issue, contrary to many folks, it's not too big to solve. It's just not. I don't believe it. And so if you don't believe it too, come talk to me. Thank you. Marlon, send us off. <laughs> Um, I think about a mentor of mine, uh, Eddie Ellis, he, uh, from a person who passed away some years ago, um, did about a quarter, 25 years in prison and did a lot of work to, um, for folks like us to be able to step into the places that we're in. Um, I remember years ago while I was inside, his organization, uh, Center for New Leadership, had somehow got a letter into the facilities about uh, using humane language around speaking around people who are uh, in prison or out of prison instead of saying ex-con or prison or inmate. And he had said it, he sent the letter inside somehow for us to organize. So I was somebody who had access to a copy machine, so I made enough copies to get around the whole jail so that I could spread around. That started with the person who was behind bars, and now we are using human-centered language, right? I think when I think about years from now, I think that we need to also see the people who are uh, currently, but also people like myself outside as not just um, people who can speak to the success of the support that they got from any organization, but to the answers to what's happening in their communities, right? As really, really people who can really help solve the, the issues. Um, but I want to add one thing. The part of the question was some things we need to be th thinking about over the next couple of years, five, ten years. Um, and, and, uh, and this speaks to starting now before it gets to the point where they're in front of uh, D.A. Bragg's desk. We have a migrant crisis in this country, in the city, right? And uh, it is, in, it is of, of our own best interest that we see ways to figure out how to streamline these folks into housing and employment somehow, right? We also know that the, 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 the determinants, the social determinants for crime is often poverty, housing issues, we know that. We often wait until the body, somebody does the thing and says, you see, I'm telling you what those people are doing. We have, we have examples. We have examples, we have history, we have books, people have written all the reports, all these sort of things. Ross Mayer, in, in terms of the things that she thought, thought said justice is. Justice is for us to think about ways to support those folks here now. Because if we don't support them now, will be, it, it could potentially be a big problem for us later, right? And I, I just thought I'd just think about something we need to be paying attention to because we only think about these folks when they come to the criminal legal space. That's the only time we tend to think about them. And, as, and any other time, it's just a nuisance or something we can ignore or walk past. I think I'm thinking about folks here or funders, folks here who are in organizations, who run organizations, be thinking about these ways to sort of look at how we can support these folks and integrate them into our communities alongside the people who are already here. I know what I'm saying, like, I think we often think from a deficit perspective where we think, like, well, we only can do that versus that. Right? That only happens when we're dealing with certain communities. We can do all of that, right? And I think that, you know, I was, and I'll, I'll conclude with this. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a convening, um, and uh, Deepak Chopra was there, right? And one of the, he was speaking about the conflict in the Middle East, but one of the things he, was speak, he said, though, was that, you know, I don't want to hear about hope. I want to hear about creative, creativity. Right? He was sort of thinking about passive hope. We want to think about passive hope. I want to think about active creativity. We have to creatively think about, as we have been doing this for 30 years, we're just speaking about what we're sort of here commemorating is a creativity of an idea that was sort of seen as something that was um, silly, uh, um, something that was probably impractical, uh, infantile even, not addressing what's happening at the moment. And here we all get to celebrate what people have done over the years from a creative idea. I want us to be able to think about how we can creatively adjust problems in a way that we have not addressed them in the past. Thank you. I want to thank our panel so much for uh, the conversation, for your friendship. I'm going to call up my colleague, uh, Danielle Mendes, who is the project director of the Midtown Community Court.
While the court remains a vital part of our work, our name doesn't quite capture all the ways that we carry out our mission to promote justice and uplift this incredible Midtown Manhattan neighborhood. And so I am very excited to announce to you tonight, drum roll please, <laughs> that we will now be known as the Midtown Community Justice Center. Thank you. 